Good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. If I had unmuted myself a few seconds earlier, good evening, sir. You would probably, you would probably have heard the stabilizer also saying good evening to you, a sign of the system in which we all live. I must first of all say thanks to Sheung for the invitation. Sheung, because he's the one who has by sheer force of his own character brought everyone together and is more or less spearheading the movement of the people. I say thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's not enough to say thanks to Sheung. I must also say thank you for keeping up the tradition. I, I did warn you that that will start making noise. If you'd give me a second, let me turn it off so that it doesn't become a major turn off. So your 15 minute lead is right now, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Welcome to the land of my birth and sojourn. I haven't escaped like everyone, according to Sheo. So let me just say, so that I get into the meat of the discussion. Thank you for the invitation, Sheo. God bless you. In however form you worship him, maybe it's Oludumari, however Baba has passed on the tradition. No, Thank you very much. No, no, no thanks needed, sir. <laughs> it's a collective effort. We thank. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Now, um, you know, when I when I saw the topic I'm, I've been asked to speak to, which is the question. Is the Nigerian constitution injuring her citizens? When I saw it, I was going to start writing out my outline so that I could at least have some sort of guard to restrain and to restrain the way my thoughts began to range when I came across that topic. And the more I tried, the, the more I found that I couldn't really write anything because if you see, I couldn't move beyond a single sentence, which is introduce and say thanks to the, say thanks to Sheung for bringing us together. Thanks members of the movement of the people and then talk. I found I couldn't jot anything and it's not for want of anything to write is because it's such a painful subject that I had to walk away from my usual practice of wearing white shirts when I appear in public. I had to wear this black because I mourn. And I would explain the reason for mourning in a few seconds. And that would be the basis of my response to this subject I've been asked to speak to. When you ask the question, there are certain presumptions behind the topic itself. The first of the presumption is that Nigerians have a constitution. That is the first of those presumptions. So it is important that in the course of having this discussion, we must define what a constitution is. The second is that Nigeria is spoken of as in the feminine gender, as though it were to be a mother. Mothers nurture, they sustain. If Nigeria is a mother, what kind of mother is Nigeria? So I realized that it is important that we understand why countries are defined either as motherland or fatherland. So is Nigeria a mother? That's the second part of what we must discuss. Is Nigeria a mother? I then realized that there is a third part to this question on which everything lands. Citizens. <laughs> Never has a word been more abused in the entire wide world than the word citizen within the context of the Nigerian nationality if there is any such thing as a Nigerian nation. 
So I would want us to discuss or rather define who a citizen is so that we can then determine whether Nigerians are actually citizens in the sense of the word citizen so that we might then speak in relation to the citizenship of the Nigerian person. So we would also then define citizens. So altogether, we have three concepts that we must define. You see, the problem with Nigeria is that English words come to Nigeria and then they begin to mean something completely different from what the original speakers of the word, given the cultural etymology of the word, the root, the meaning of the word itself was intended to convey. You find very quickly that words like uh, bogus, for instance, he came to Nigeria to die. In Nigeria, bogus became big. That wasn't the intention of the Oibo man. And even he would not recognize that word by the time he gets to Nigeria. But that is one of the more obvious ones. So let's now begin to deal with the ones that we have identified in the question. The first is the word constitution. So what is a constitution? A constitution is not, it's not an esoteric thing. Don't let anybody lie to you. It's nothing big that cannot be understood by anybody. A constitution simply means the set of rules by which a group of people have agreed to be governed. So whether those rules evolved over time in bits and pieces, as was the case in Britain, which is why they say the British constitution is unwritten. That's the lie, it is written. If it is not written down in one place, it is written in several documents, which form the body of documents that constitutes the British constitution. There is also the part that it is unwritten, which is part of their own custom. That, those are their customary laws. You can't reduce every custom to writing. English customary laws are the unwritten part of their constitution. It's been given the force of law by the acceptance of the people living in that place to be law, which is why, for instance, the law related to bigamy, which is when you have more than one wife, does not bind any Nigerian because really our custom is stronger than that British law, which is rooted in British tradition. And being a patriarchal society is easy to ignore that and then focus on the fact that it is those. So let me not even die. Let me not travel too far. This is happening because I can write a note. So don't worry, you tolerate me. So now what is a constitution? A constitution is simply the set of rules by which you have agreed to be bound. So in Nigeria, do we have a constitution? No, we do not. Not since 1963 have Nigerians given themselves a constitution. The last, constitutions, the last constitution Nigerians wrote for themselves was written in 1963. It was an amendment of the 1960 constitution which itself arose out of several constitutional conferences before the British left in 1960. So at no point since 1963 have Nigerians written themselves a constitution. Yes, they would have talked to you about the 1979 constitution that came out of the 1977 Constituent Assembly, but I stand there as a witness of history to tell you that that constitution of 1979 is not reflective of the will of the Constituent Assembly as was expressed in his report to Obasanjo's regime. We simply issued a decree expressing his own will over and above that of what was expressed by the Constituent Assembly of 1977, which never recommended a presidential system. Yes, there was a minority recommendation, but the majority recommendation was for a parliamentary system. It never recommended the, the parliament and the presidential system of government that, were, that they went to copy from the Americans. It never recommended the inclusion of the land use decree. It never recommended the inclusion of what became known as um, the, the NYSC decree and several others. It was simply the expression of Obasanjo and his cohort's will. If you didn't know who Obasanjo was in 1979, you certainly know who he is today. He's a self-interested thief. End of story. Now, 
So as far as I'm concerned, the 1999 constitution, which was an imposition of the Abdul Salam government, which was the one who inherited the mantle of the thief known as Abacha, whom Buhari has told you is not a thief but a saint, understand very clearly that the constitution of 1999 did not come from the will of the Nigerian people. It is disconnected from the Nigerian people. It is the root of all the agitations that you see within the Nigerian space. The demand for devolution of power, the demand for restructuring, the demand for secession, all these demands are arising out of the inequities of the constitution of 1999 that did not arise from the will of the Nigerian people. So much so that when it says, we the people, all it was referring to were those still Thin khaki boys, those ones who stole our commonwealth and patrimony, like that one whom God has afflicted inside the rock in Mina. Those were the people whose will are reflected in the 1999 constitution. Let's be clear about that. That is one. So now, is Nigeria a mother? When countries have developed the capacity to project power, they call their countries their fatherland. That is why you hear the Germans talk about the fatherland, because it's a militaristic tradition. Nigeria cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, be said to be militaristic to the point where it can project power and call itself a fatherland. So it will sometimes project motherhood and lie that it is a motherland. But the fact of the matter is that if Nigeria were to be a mother, she's a most cannibalistic mother that consumes her inhabitant. We've seen that happen at Lekki Gate. We saw that happen in Kaduna or was it not in Zaria. We see that happen almost routinely with the, with the Shia in Kaduna and also in Abuja. We see it happen almost on a daily basis with the treatment of Nigerian people. I will not let, use the word people don't use the word citizen, but I'll come to that. The treatment of the Nigerian people by law enforcement agencies who are not themselves bound by law does not suggest that Nigeria is anybody's mother. If she's a mother, she's a whore, a whore that also consumes his own fetus. That girl that died in Ojota yesterday, I only seen is that she's a Nigerian. So let nobody talk to me about a motherland. Nigeria is nobody's motherland. It does not nurture. Whether you are an Ausa man, a Fulani man, the children in Kankara are Fulani. Whether you are in Zamfara, in Zamfara is a civil war between Ausa and Fulani. Those are Nigerians too. They deserve every right to security. But when we begin to embrace the lies that they tell us, we ignore to realize that it is a nation, the only thing nationalized about Nigeria is the, are the sufferings of the Nigerian people. So the Nigerian state, please, let's not use the word murder for it anymore. It is, if anything, is a murderer. The Nigerian state is not a murder, it's a murderer. So please, it is, uh, it's, when you say ha, it's not a ha, use it. Is the Nigerian constitution injuring its... Now let's now deal with the conclusion. Citizens, who told you you are citizens? Who is a citizen? Let me tell you who a citizen is. Self-determination is what separates a slave and a citizen. The capacity for self-determination separates the slave and the freeborn. Only freeborns are citizens. You in Nigeria are not a citizen. However much you might have, how much, maybe how much money you might have, they beat Abiola in this town. Abiola was smart with his children at the peak of the military junta. That was during, those were during the years of his best friend. Babangida. Abiola was beaten by Air Force officers. I think it was during the years of Nureni Yusuf. Naked, brutal power. It didn't matter who he was because it was 
a situation where whether it was then, whether it is now, the Nigerian is not a citizen. If the Nigerian were to be a citizen, he would have the capacity to write his own constitution. Writing constitutions are, is in itself an act of self-determination, is an expression of your humanity. When that is taken away from you in a military regime, it is easy to rationalize. But what has happened to Nigerians is that you have been systematically enslaved and your constitution is essentially a charter of slavery if it must be called its true name. So if I might now bring this to a close, <laughs> is the Nigerian fraudulent constitution of 1999 injuring its citizens. No, sorry, sorry, error. Injuring its, what do I call you guys now? Okay, injuring its subjects, <laughs> its selves. Because the masses. If you are not, so is it injuring you? <laughs> I don't believe you need me to answer that question. You already know exactly what is done to you because I know exactly what is done to me. I have been constrained. I have been constrained. And that is the lot of every Nigerian. We are like birds with wings that have been placed in cages and we simply can't fly because we are born Nigerians. We have been constrained. Yeah, we can call ourselves denizens. I occasionally carry that word and use it myself, especially because it rhymes with citizens and make you feel a little less, uh, what shall I say now, bad with yourself. But the reality really is this. The right to self-determination is the hallmark of citizenship. The Nigerian is not a citizen. To ask if the fraud is injuring us is to state the obvious. You all, without exception, Nigerians, each and every one of us, outside of the ruling class, are similarly afflicted. Whether you are Igbo, Ausa, Fulani, whatever you care to be, as long as you are not a member of the Nigerian ruling class, you are similarly afflicted. The pains of citizenship laws might have been perfected in the land of Ndigo, but it has gone sufficiently all over Nigeria. Even the people of Kankara are feeling it. The insecurity is just one of the fruits. Thank you very much for having allowed me the pleasure of hearing the sound of my own voice. I enjoy it. Thank you very much for your time. A round of applause. Thank you very wow. much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Jay sir. Thank you. We're very grateful. Mm -hmm. I believe I believe we'll now take some time for questions while we still have uh, Mr. Gary with us. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, uh, put it in a comment or raise your hand up and uh, we'll unmute you so you can speak. I'll now give the floor to our pro tem chairman, uh, Comrade Sheon Kuti, to ask his questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a little, just a little contribution, and uh, uh, my own little thank you message to Comrade uh, Dilly. I'm very happy that you joined us today to share this very enlightening uh, um, epistemology on constitution, constitutionality, and what it means to be citizens. I, I missed everything because the ruling class of Nigeria understanding that we are doing this meeting today, sabotage my internet between eight, uh, 6.40 until five minutes ago. I could not uh, even hear what my comrade was saying. But as soon as the uh, lecture was about to be over, everything is working smoothly. So, Whoever this, whoever this new uh, Israeli firm that they've got in to police the internet, I think they are real professionals. They know what they are doing. I want to add that uh, we have to remember as African people, 
that African people never had what they call a constitution. We had laws. And our laws were so natural, were so natural to the state of being of our humanity. That children from the age of seven, eight, nine were what Oyibo people would call lawyer today in that system. It is not a coincidence that the first lawyers in Africa did not arrive until the 20th century. And the first African lawyers did not arrive, uh, did not uh, emerge in our continent in the 20th century because African man never did the lawyer. The law, the law was so natural because it was in line with justice. We must remember that not only in our country, but all over the world, the constitution, this world, this world that they say constitution, although they say it reflects the culture and nature of the people that it governs, actually only reflects the culture and nature of the rich people that it governs. The constitutions all over the world are not only our constitution, are written to protect the interest and the property of the rich people from the anger and righteousness of the poor. You know, so as we look at our own constitution in Nigeria and as we look at ways to develop and move our country forward, I want to ask my comrade there that are there steps that we can take to begin to Africanize the laws or if that's not even the way to Africanize the system that governs our law, to bring law, to bring the law of the land away from maintaining order, away from maintaining um. order to actually promote justice. You know, okay. Let me ask that again. So it's clear that is there a way that we can no, I hear you. the system? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Because I, I hear could hear some feedback. Uh, I could hear I can hear it too. You see, the thing is, see that DSS officer who jammed your system, he did he did a fantastic <laughs> job. One of the things I addressed in tracing the problem with what we call a constitution was to point out the fact that when the British claim that their constitution is unwritten, is because what they are claiming is unwritten, the portion that is unwritten are their own customary laws, which they have accepted amongst themselves as being sacrosanct. So over the years, for hundreds of years, they had perfected these laws and codified them in case laws. So they've become established as customs. But because our own progress was interrupted by the horror, horrific incidents and crimes of slavery, cultural genocide, and all that had happened to us, our customary laws have been relegated. And those customary laws arises from the spirituality of the people. Spirituality is different from religiosity, which is what has now been given to the African. So you find that when you ask an African man to swear by Ogun, he's afraid. He might tell you it's because he's a Christian that he will not swear by Ogun. No, it's because he actually fears that Ogun more than the Bible. He is related to that culturally. So when we speak about how to bring our customary laws or bring our laws back to where it used to be before our unfortunate contact with the first, the Arabs and then the Europeans, the reality is that the African would first of all have to redefine the context of his humanity, understand the importance and centrality of that humanity within the context of the African society, which was why when the Europeans came here, the first thing they went away with was the knowledge of the fact that no poor person lived amongst us because we lived equitably. There is always enough for everybody's needs. It's the greed that you can service. So, the question you've asked, reality is that the only way it is achievable within the context of our current realities would be that we manage to break the cycle of oppression, gain power somehow, and make that power related to the people so that it belongs back to them. And law is now not about enforcing the will of the state, maintaining the state, but it will be about the promotion of the general good. 
unless there is a revolution that turns Africa around, not just Nigeria, you are not ever going to get that utopia. It would always be about the enforcement of law, which would always be class-based, not humanity-based. Thank you very much. Thank you. MOP, you are the seen our work, you are the year on our work, you are the year on our work, you are the year on our work, so um, I have um, two questions also for Dele Farah, if I may. Um, the first question is, what do you think are the two major um, problems with the constitution that is being loaded over us right now? And the second problem is, how do you think we can go about creating a new constitution? And, ex and the second part of that question is, how do you think we can go about exchanging this new constitution um, with the, um, um, for the present one that is being protected by the oligarchy? Um, the first of the problems with our constitution is the fact that it does not flow from the will of the people themselves. It does not flow from the desires of the Nigerian people. At no point in the history of Nigeria did Nigerians agree that the federating, the, the federal government should begin to create federating units and then take Nigeria from the original four regions that were there in 1966 and reshape it into what is today not a federation but just pretends and lies that it is. Like I said before, English words come to die in Nigeria. Nigeria is not a federation. It's just a province. It's a country with, a, with 36 provinces and one headquarter of the caliphate. At best, what we call a democracy is a feudal system. So when it comes to what the problem is specifically with that constitution, it is that it is not designed to meet the desires and aspirations of Nigerians. It was designed to protect the interest of a class, not even a people. It's not a tribe, a class. Now, the same thing you ask is this, how do we go about the business of replacing this one with a desired one? One of the most difficult tasks for Nigerians and yet the only way we can ever achieve what you have asked is that in spite of our perceived differences, we must urgently begin the task of uniting ourselves. And I would explain, those who rule us profit by dividing us. In dividing us, our strengths and capacities are dissipated. Our capacity to act in concert with each other is a good enough thing that the pro tem chairman of MOP is a musician of note. If you run a band, if there is disharmony and dissonance between the wind instrument and the string instrument, you find very quickly that what you are producing is not music, it's noise. That is what you currently find in Nigeria, dissonance. A is shouting, I want to leave. That one is shouting, I want to go. That one is saying, I'm being marginalized. The reality though, is that outside of the ruling class, which is not in any way divided by religion or tribe, they are all friends. They marry each other, they marry each other's daughters, they do business together. Outside of those people, Every Nigerian, whoever, wherever you come from, we are all equally afflicted. But we ignore all of this when we emphasize the differences that those who oppress us and are beneficiaries of the current system. Look at in the National Assembly, when Ponde was busy fainting, where were the legislators from the Niger Delta? Everybody was busy having the mic. Is a class thing. When we, instead of us to focus on the commonalities of our afflictions, so that we can then sell 
alternative visions to the Nigerian people. As a collective, what you find is that the Yorubas will be saying one thing, as if the Yorubas can speak with one voice. Ndigo will be saying another thing, at least somebody is presuming to speak on behalf of Ndigo. Just as there are made several people who want to leave, for every name they can, I assure you, there is that one that is washing butter in Lagos. There is one. I'm, I know that is reductio ad absurdum, but the reality of the matter is that there is no uniformity of opinion. You can only find consensus. Is it so difficult for us to understand the fact that the world is to unite behind common cause, and then if you are united, make yourselves equal under the law, come equally yoked to the law, why is it so difficult at that point to discuss every other issue that afflicts us? So yes, we can change the constitution, but we can only do that when we have united ourselves, understanding the commonalities of our affliction and the need to ensure that we are all offered the same deal under the law, equality. That is the root of citizenship. If we are not prepared to fight to become citizens, the beneficiaries of the system will never ever give it to us. Nobody gives liberty. They don't to anybody. You fight for it. You take it. It's not something that you you don't you don't. Nobody will serve it to you. It's not a la carte. You are not in a restaurant. It's not rest. That's why I salute somebody like Yele. He's unyielding in his position that he will never bend when it comes to demanding his citizenship right. That is a man. But enough of us have to find the spine behind the purpose. It's not enough to stand up and say, I no agree. Okay, we've had no agree, but what do you want? That is the message we need to find and then take to the Nigerian people. So yes, it is possible to change the constitution. It's difficult. It's not a walk in the park. It's actually more difficult than demanding secession, but it is possible. Um, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, um, thank you I so am... much. Uh, please hold on. Uh, we'll have to take the next uh, question from Comrade Michael King. After Comrade Michael King, then you can go next. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was supposed to put my hand down. He has answered the question I was about to ask. Okay. Please go ahead, previous speaker. Please go ahead, the previous speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Farid Dunia. Thank, thanks to everyone. Doctor, doctor. Okay. No, 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 sorry, let me quickly correct you. I'm not a doctor. I only I managed to squeeze one degree out of the university after 20 years. <laughs> I am not a professor. <laughs> Thank doctor. you, sir. <laughs> only Thank me. you, everyone. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, but um, they're actually related. The first one is um the Nigerian states that we have currently, before I answer, ask the question, I realized that us being Nigerians, the, the system that has been established is an oppressor-oppressed relationship. And one of the things that, one of my concerns for the Nigerian people is how one, oppressed people tends to get power and they become oppressors. Which major ways can we actually remove that oppressive spirit? Because the narratives, that are out there in the Nigerian states and also many parts of the capitalists, many countries that are capitalist in nature, they are mostly dominant in an individualistic type of oppressive values. Secondly, um, regarding consciousness, before there, I, feel, I feel like before there is any revolution in any form, there is need for consciousness. And it seems like um, the consciousness that we have is not sufficient for enough for a revolution that would lead get that would lead to the power of the power of the people so that people will get and and um, acquire such power so how efficient can we acquire and um, re reclaim such consciousness as a group of people in immediate um yeah in an immediate fashion in which it's not going to take a long period of time those are my two questions thank you all right um see i'll try and be as short as i can so that Okay, let me say this. Yes, 
it's always been that bullied children tend to become bullies themselves. So yeah, oppressed people given powers, unconscionable powers most of the time tend to become oppressors themselves. You are very correct. But there is a very important precept that you have omitted to factor into the equation when you configure it like that. And that is the place of systems. Systems are always run by men, but systems are also indicative of what the men who designed the system considered important. The American constitution, like any other constitution, but I'm deliberately using the American constitution because of the example it provides in the moment. The American constitution was designed by men who had felt the effect of tyrannical powers. They had um, tasted, I'm sorry, okay, they brought the light back early. The, 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 they've tasted tyrannical power, I believe it was in the hand of King George of England, because the America in those days was a colony and they'd been taxed heavily one form or the other and they, 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 they rebelled against that holder. So in, in bringing their new republic into being, they sought to create a utopia where no man had absolute powers. So they created a system of checks and balances in the American constitution, which was designed specifically to check against the emergence of a tyrant, such as the English kings they were escaping. So the priorities they had in their mind shaped the constitution they drafted. It became the basis for drafting the archetypical tyrant. And that is the effect you saw of Donald Trump. So mm -hmm. as much okay. as people might disagree with Donald Trump, what you found was that the system was sufficiently strong enough to ensure that it did not transmute into a full-blown tyrant unchecked by law. That mm -hmm. was the effect of the forward thinking of the designers of the American constitution. So their priorities shaped their choices. Just okay. as I had explained earlier on that the priorities of the crooks who wrote the 1999 constitution also shaped their choices. So what you <laughs> found in the 1999 constitution are functions of the priorities and choices of the crooks who were in power. So now it is up to those who find the grace and capacity to bat the Nigerian nation out of the Nigerian state, which is dying, to ensure that they place sufficient rail guards in the constitution to ensure that we do not become a banana republic again. And that can only happen when citizenship is bestowed on the peoples who are currently just <laughs> indigenous, denizens, and whatever else you might call yourselves. If you become citizens, all equal under the law, then you have a state that is ruled by law. It is only at that point that you can begin to deal with the content of the law and you can begin to talk about political ideology, which you can then place in the political place and marketplace and sell your political ideas, maybe socialist ideas, which seek to give power to the people and bring policies. But all of this is anchored on a constitution, which has already ensured that the citizen is central and that the law also rules. The law never gives a power that it also does not limit and define. The only reason Nigeria is the way it is, is because it is not governed by law. So let's go to the second part of your question. The consciousness of the people. I think you are mistaken. I think the Nigerian people are sufficiently conscious of the fact of their suffering. 
what they are not is informed about the origin of their sufferings okay. and the solution to their suffering. Because okay. those who should be busy informing them are busy in churches and mosques. Yeah. They are busy running existential battles. Some people will yeah. leave their homes. Some people are out of bed by 4.30 in the morning. Out of bed. By 5, 5.10, they are their bus stop. And they are not back in their homes until about 11.30, 12 at night. Five, six days a week. When is that person going to find time to inform those he has the duty to educate and inform? When does he inform himself? How is he informed? Ignorance and poverty have been weaponized against the Nigerian people to the point where they have become sufficiently existential that they cannot even grasp the issues. So the issues have been simplified for them. So it is that man who does not speak your language. It is the Igbo. Actually, it's the Yoruba. In fact, the problem are the Fulanis. In fact, if it's not for those Christians, uh, yes, it's not Twitter. The Twitter ban is because uh, Mark Dorsey is uh, now the Kano's father or stepfather. That is why they banned it and they are protesting in the South. Oh, yes, the Fulani, uh, look, at the end of the day, Nigerians are sufficiently conscious of the fact of their pains. If they were not conscious of it, you will not find Nigerians escaping through the Sahara Desert, dying in the Mediterranean, being, uh, being forced into the into dehumanizing sex trade in Europe for $5 in Parisian parks. They know they were conscious enough to run away and escape the blight in our own country. What nobody has told them is to inform them and then offer them the alternative. If I hear anybody call Nigerians cowards any longer, I think the person should slap themselves. Nigerians are not cowards. A coward does not cross Sahara Desert. A coward does not go in a dingy across the Mediterranean. Those are not the actions of cowards. Those are the actions of desperate, hopeless people. Question is, what have we who claim to be conscious, what have we done to inform? Because there is a world of difference between being conscious of your pain and being informed as to its origin and to the cure. So it is when we have taken on the mantle and we are ready to do the job of informing and educating our people that is the only time when we can speak because the consciousness you speak to, if I may be truthful with you, it is suggestive of when are they going to be frustrated enough to collapse into a orgy of violence? Because the assumption has always been that the only way to gain a revolution is to be violent. The truth really is that there need not be any violence if we who claim to be conscious, educated and informed, get off our high horses find the platforms wherever they be found to speak to the Nigerian people in the language they understand, in the language that they understand. If you are even going to vote out anybody, you have to connect the people to the electoral process before you can vote them out. Less than 30 million people have voted in any Nigerian election. And you are talking about a voting population of well over 100 million. I don't know how many are registered to vote. Those of you who are interested in the electoral process will be aware. I have no interest whatsoever in the electoral process. It is my hope that at some point sufficient, maybe after we might be long dead or now, if we are blessed, maybe someday we'll find the grace to do what we need to do. But until we inform them and then mobilize them, after educating them, nothing is gonna change. Thank you very much. Comrade, thank you very much, D sir. Mr. Dilley. Thank you very much. So, we'll let uh, Comrade Ayo Ademilui uh, ask his question. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Very well, sir. Okay, my, my name is Ayo Ademilui. I'm of the movement for a socialist alternative. Um, as, an, as, an, as a socialist organization, we all of all view society on the basis of classes. 
on the basis of the fact that current society we are running came to a particular point in time uh, as a result of uh, class contradictions that happened. And that is very, very important in understanding the kind of constitution we have today in Nigeria, why that constitution is not working the way it is, and why we are having all the problems of national question that we have. Now, the 1999 constitution, which is the essence constitution as of today, is self emerged out of the class contradictions or the class struggle that emerged in the 90s. If you remember very well, it was the anti military struggle, first of all, that forced uh, the military government of that time, in, time, in terms of uh, Absalom Abu Bakr, to even to proceed on the, on, on the part of civil rule. So that the constitution at that particular point in time gives you a picture. It's a picture of balance of class, of class uh, forces. And there's no way those, uh, that, those, uh, balance, that balance can be obtained without uh, the mobilization of the forces that are played. And if you look at it, chapter two of the Eastern Constitution contains a very important, a very important, very important provisions. It gives you right to, it gives you wide uh, provisions as to education, healthcare. In fact, it even talks about nationalization of the commodity rights of the economy. You may think that that is very close to a socialist program, but it is not. It's far, it's just at, a, at best a social democratic program. But on the basis why the military, despite even their rottenness, accepted that thing as a document, first and foremost as a document. It is on the basis of the fact that they realized that in every way, the uh, agitation of the left, especially in 1978 in the, in the Constitutional Assembly, and then the minority report written by Bala Osman and uh, you know, Shebu Oshoba, encapsulated all those demands. It was a reflection of concession to that agitation. But they now put a clause that is not justiciable. It can't be, you can't even litigate upon it. You can't take anybody to court upon it. They now put us to the scenario. That why do we go from here? First and foremost, in the fact that, yes, it is clear that that constitution did not emerge from a democratic input of the working people of Nigeria. So the basic thing is to all put the working people to mobilize them on their feet, to mobilize them politically. And that is very important that, uh, uh, for instance, the movement of the people as led by Shemkuti is organizing this program to educate the people. And then to begin to mobilize our people correctly. We must, we must have a people-led constitution making. And we must be clear about our demand. We are rejecting the extant uh, constitution of Republic of Nigeria and like 99 as amended. But it just only tells you that where are we exactly in terms of political weight as a class? Are we where we exactly we need to be? And that's boils down again to the question of building a political mortality. There's no way we want to start mobilizing today for a new, genuine people process constitution without a political, without a political, without a political mortality. And then it all boils down to the next question that uh, our constitution. That means that we need to we need to get to where the people are, educate them properly about what their programs and demands should be, and then uh, put them on their feet. Up to even the question of a constituent uh, assembly. And when we when we this raise the question of constituent assembly, we are not fluid. We are not fluid about it. It's not going to just be a, a discussion meeting. It's not just going to be a meeting of uh, sharing of ideas. It's also a, it's, it's properly should be a constituent assembly of people, a organ of political power to counterpose against uh, uh, the assemblage of the ruling class today. Now, it's not impossible that national assembly themselves can begin to contemplate the constituent assembly. There are a lot of crises already on the hands of the Nigerian real elite. The Buhari regime said it's just one out of those problems. It's, it's, it was it a matter of a contradiction, and it's going to also ease itself out by contradictions. So the, the, the fact is that today, uh, if a constant assembly is even praised by the Nigerian real elite themselves, we must begin to see how to catapult our own people's constant assembly to that kind of assembly. And then ultimately, the MOP and forces on the left, like Socialist Party of Nigeria, like other left forces, need to continue to uh, challenge uh, and demand for the wider electoral and democratic space 
ultimately the question of taking into power of the ruling elite. Without that, they are, if they write on their constitutions under this capitalist system, it would definitely, effectively, effectively be in their own, uh, in their own uh, interest. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Comrade okay. Ayo Ademilui. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Dilley, follow to me. How many minutes? We know that you are running on a deadline. How many minutes do you still have with us? So we know how to proceed. Thank you. Um, I Maybe I am one of those inveterate teachers. I should have run away five minutes ago, but I'm hoping that you decide when to release me and you'll be kind enough as to make it as quick as you can. But I don't want to run away without notification and without your permission and blessing. Okay, comrade. Okay, uh, comrade. Uh, uh, comrade, I will we allow Chimkuti to release you. So, pro tem chairman, please release uh, Mr. Dilifaro to me. As the pro tem chairman, I give you the permission to jack Massa. I mean, you Thank can, you very uh, much. <laughs> we appreciate May the force be so with much. you all. Thank you. We appreciate the knowledge you've imparted here today. And um, I want you to know we don't take it for granted. These lecture series much. are not a, a listening event, it is um, ideas that we want to turn into action. And we thank, thank you. Thank you very much for contributing to that. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Bye bye.